This program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. This time on Subtext. Michael L. Ross on his new book, The Oil Curse, How Petroleum Wealth Shapes the Development of Nations. Hello, my name is Chris Gondek. And today I'm speaking with Michael Ross, professor of political science here at UCLA, about his new book, The Oil Curse, How Petroleum Wealth Shapes the Development of Nations. Professor Ross, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. You know, it must be odd for people who are out in the world that are sitting there pumping gas, paying a lot of money for it, to think that any oil wealth would be anything but a benefit for countries. So how is it that mineral wealth, particularly oil wealth, affects the development of nations? It's a good question. Um, certainly somebody benefits when a country finds and produces lots of oil wealth, but it's not necessarily the people. Often it's the government that benefits. and the people who are in charge of the government. You find that around the world, maybe three dozen or so developing countries have a lot of oil wealth and produce substantial amounts. And those tend to be the countries that are the least democratic, partly because their governments and whoever's in charge of those governments benefit so greatly from the country's oil wealth that they can keep themselves in power, even if people start to grow discontented. So one of the things out of your book that made me really think about our situation here in the United States and then going back to the developed countries is the fact that oil revenues give these countries so much money that in some ways it, it takes away the political participation and economic participation of these citizens. And you talk about taxes and how taxes are actually pretty important for how, country, how I guess, political systems can be developed. Could you expand on that? Sure. You know, j just as people are shaped by what they eat. Governments are shaped by the kinds of revenues that they collect. It's their food. It's what shapes their character. Now, we don't notice this that much because most governments depend on the same kind of revenue. They collect taxes from their people. And everywhere around the world, people hate paying taxes. There's nothing surprising about that. But what is surprising, and what we learn when we look at governments that don't have to collect taxes, is that when people pay taxes, they demand in return accountability from their government. They demand that the government spends the money in ways that benefit them, and they watch the government much more closely. Governments, on the other hand, that have the luxury of funding themselves through oil revenues or other kinds of mineral revenues, or sometimes even foreign aid, they don't have to pay the same kind of attention to the people, and people are more likely to kind of give the government a pass. They don't look so closely at what happens, and they often don't demand the same kind of accountability. So ironically, taxation tends to lead to representation. There's a close link between paying taxes and making your government more accountable. This is a key reason why governments that rely on oil to fund themselves are a whole lot less accountable than others. Let's cut to the chase on something. People watching here might be thinking, okay, we're talking about countries that have a lot of oil wealth, that might be politically less developed as other ones. We're obviously talking about Middle East countries. So here's your chance. Are we only talking about the countries in the Middle East that we're thinking about oil producers in your book? Or is there a broader spectrum that you're talking about that aren't necessarily the trope we might be thinking about Middle East oil shakedom that has all this money and keeps their citizens politically naive? Well, it's not surprising that the oil-rich countries of the Middle East, because they have more oil than anybody else, are most affected by the oil curse, probably as a region, than any other region. So we're certainly talking about the Saudi Arabias and Iran and Iraq and Libya and so forth. But only about half, fewer than half, of the oil-rich countries around the developing world are in the Middle East. There are quite a few others that are scattered around Sub-Saharan Africa, like Gabon and Angola and Equatorial Guinea and Nigeria that are found in Central Asia, like Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan. 
They're found in Southeast Asia, countries like Myanmar and Brunei and Malaysia, and even in Latin America, Venezuela, uh, Colombia, uh, now Brazil. All are important oil and gas producers, and all are affected to some degree by the problems that I focus on in my book. So even though the oil producers tend to be concentrated in the Middle East, and so we tend to notice those problems more, the same phenomenon is affecting countries all around the world. Taking it, keeping it there just briefly, um, the Arab Spring. Is it a coincidence that the countries that really went through the Arab Spring, such as Egypt, uh, Libya, I think might be the exception, but we're talking Tunisia, that those countries that actually had fairly strong uprising to the point where they changed their governments are countries that are not particularly blessed with a great deal of oil? I think that's right. Um, you know, there are two facts that stand out for me about the Arab Spring. One is that just about all countries had people rising up demanding more freedom, okay? The, the appeal of democracy and freedom is universal, and we, we saw it across the region, just like we see it everywhere else. But in the countries that have more oil, the governments were more effective at putting these protests down and keeping the protesters from getting what they ultimately wanted, which was more freedom and more accountability. So the places where the protests had the greatest success in Egypt and Tunisia are the countries that had very little oil wealth. Others that don't have much oil wealth, Morocco, Jordan, saw substantial reforms, even though the governments weren't replaced. Governments felt like they really needed to respond by introducing new accountability measures and uh, more transparency sometimes. On the other hand, the governments that have the most oil wealth, like the Persian Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Kuwait, um, Algeria, uh, even Syria, which has a, certain, a significant amount of oil wealth, these were much less responsive and much better, better able to cling to power despite their unpopularity often. Now, the great exception, as you, as you indicated, is, uh, is Libya. And I think if you, if you remember what was happening about a year ago, um, the, um, the story was that the Gaddafi regime, faced with tremendous discontent and, and protests around the country, was becoming more and more successful at putting down the rebellion and was actually on the verge of quashing and, and uh, snuffing out the opposition through, through considerable brutality. Were it not for the NATO intervention, I think everybody who who looks at this closely agrees that the Gaddafi regime would be in power today. So it's really not that different. Um, uh, you see an oil-funded government that's much more adept, much more powerful and skillful at repressing democratic pressures and could only be overthrown by military force, in this case exerted from the outside. Let's talk about Iraq. Obviously been in the news here in the United States for many years because of our occupation. Now that the United States has left, are we beginning to see the oil curse come back in Iraq? Iraq is the great experiment right now, and I don't think there's a, we should jump to any conclusions about where it's going. It's still, it's still uncertain. What we know is that a very repressive oil-backed regime was overthrown by military force, and a new government was put in place under basically U.S. supervision. Now that the U.S. has withdrawn, we have to watch very closely what's going to happen. There's been some erosion, I think, in the last year in the checks and balances on the Maliki government. The Maliki government um, increasingly arresting uh, protesters and dissidents, um, eroding some of the parliament's power, uh, less freedom of the press. So. It's moving in some worrisome directions, but that doesn't mean that, uh, that it won't succeed. I should add that if it does, Iraq will be by far the country with the greatest amount of oil wealth to ever make a successful transition to democracy. So it's an important one to watch. And we'll be right back. The world needs more impossible, more unconventional, unreasonable, unhinged. Keep telling us we're naive, that we should get real, that we don't have a shot. 
every barrier, we have a breakthrough. Every obstacle, a leap forward. For every cynic, these inspiring grounds have given us an optimist. And welcome back. You know, in the last couple of questions, answers, uh, you talked about both uh, Gaddafi in Libya and Saddam Hussein in Iraq. And these are two men that had things to do in their countries that really ended up being the dividing line, historically, I found in your book, between uh, the privately owned oil fields of the Middle East and also these other developing countries that we would see up until the 60s. And then that large wave of state, private, uh, state ownership that took place in the 1970s. Why is it such an important dividing line for the oil curse? That's right. It turns out that the oil curse hasn't always been there. Until the 1970s, the world of petroleum was controlled by a handful of international companies, the Shell and BP and Chevron, the so-called Seven Sisters. And oil-rich countries, including Iraq and Libya, at that time didn't really have that much control over the, the oil in their own territory. And hence, their governments didn't get all that much revenue from this oil wealth. That all began to change in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And a key part of that change was the decision of governments to nationalize the foreign-owned companies that were controlling their oil, a completely understandable and very popular decision. But what we saw in cases, for example, like Iraq and Libya, was that that moment of nationalization was the opportunity for very savvy politicians like Saddam, like Gaddafi, to rise to power. And both of those leaders, in fact, made nationalization a key part of their appeal. Saddam was the rather obscure government official who was in charge of nationalization in Iraq and rode that all the way to the presidency and his extraordinary and repressive power. Gaddafi, after coming to power in a coup in 1969, one of his first acts was to nationalize. And this gave him and his government a windfall of revenues, which they were able to use to extend their power and put, put forward the, the revolution that, uh, that kept them in, in office for, uh, for decades to come. A windfall of revenues. but. We don't really know how much revenue is. You know, when I read that part, I was thinking about OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, and how really back in the 70s, as a child in the 70s, I would remember saying, oh, it's a cartel that's, that's mm -hmm. holding back prices and making decisions. But having read your book, it just seems as though these countries switched from a privately run cartel of the oil companies themselves to a, I guess, state-run cartel of, of, of these, these oil-producing states. I Just take a step back, how did the private or companies back in the 50s and 60s organize oil so that, because oil prices were very steady up until this, the nationalizations. That's right. One of the ways that they were able to keep prices steady was by controlling production in countries around the world. And so the, the government of Iraq, for example, wanted to produce more, it wanted more revenues, it wanted to help its own people. And the foreign companies that controlled production there refused to, um, to allow it. 99.5% of Iraq's territory was closed to oil exploration and production by, by foreign companies. So this is how they were able to control global supply and manage the flow of oil and keep prices steady, which had some benefits, I suppose, certainly for, for consumers. We didn't have the kinds of big fluctuations in prices that we see today. But it also meant that the people of these countries couldn't benefit from their nation's own resource wealth. So it was highly unjust. And, um, and I think there are good reasons why the system was dismantled. Uh, citizens of these countries not benefiting from their oil. Now, in theory, as they're state owned, they should be benefiting it. But as I learned from your book, half of them really aren't benefiting it, and that's women. How, do, how are women affected by the oil curse in these developing countries? That's right. Um, what happened in nationalization was that the extraordinary unjust power and wealth that was held by these foreign companies passed directly into the hands of governments, not into the hands of people. And subsequently, some people in the population benefited, 
some parts of the year economies grew. But what we find in oil-rich countries is typically that some sectors grow and other sectors don't do well due to an economic effect called the Dutch disease. What happens, though, is that the sectors that boom tend to be the ones that employ men, construction and retail services. The sectors that tend to draw women into the labor force to give them their own income, to um, encourage families to educate their daughters and uh, invest in them, those sectors of the economy, which tend to be manufacturing, export-oriented manufacturing, sweatshops really, um, those tend to get crowded out. Those don't, those never appear, they never grow. Or if they do, when oil comes online, they disappear. So ironically, not through any evil decisions made by governments, but simply due to these economic effects, oil-rich countries tend to have many fewer opportunities for women than for men. And surprisingly, in the Middle East, this explains a large part of the reason why women have not made the same advances that they've made elsewhere in, in other parts of the world. Um, you, you, you know, Americans tend to think, oh, it must have something to do with Islam. Islam is bad for women. That's, that's not clear that that's really true. There are a lot of Islamic countries um, where women have done very well. Malaysia, Indonesia, Bangladesh, in the Middle East, uh, Morocco and Tunisia, the countries without oil. It's the countries with lots of oil, like Algeria and the Gulf states, where women haven't had nearly the same opportunities. Despite all of their skills, despite education, they just haven't been able to make their way into the labor force and into political life. Let's talk about a country a little closer to home, Mexico. Uh, Mexico, I'm thinking they do have maquiladores and sweatshops. They also have quite a deal of oil wealth and they nationalized a lot earlier than a lot of other countries. It, is Mexico an outlier? Do you think Mexico is affected by the oil curse? You know, in some ways, yes. In some ways, uh, Mexico is different. I mean, Mexico in some ways is a, a positive example. You're right that they nationalized much earlier and I think it's no coincidence that they were really the last significant country in Latin America to, to move to democracy outside of Cuba. Um, they were able to have a, a single party state hold on much longer and I think oil had something to do with that. Having said that, um, they are the country with the greatest oil wealth in the last 40 years to make a transition to democracy and I think, I think they sh they, there's a lot, to be, uh, a lot to be proud of and a lot to, um, to learn from there. When it comes to women, the story's a little bit different. Because they're located so close to the U.S., even though they have this oil wealth, they've been able to develop the, a pretty good manufacturing sector, as you said, the maquiladoras, and a lot of them employ women. So women actually have not been crowded out of the labor force there the way they have been in some other oil-rich countries. Um, so there's some important positive examples, some pieces of the oil curse, but also some, uh, some real progress. And we'll be right back. The world needs more impossible, more unconventional, unreasonable, unhinged. Keep telling us we're naive, that we should get real that we don't have a shot. For every barrier, we have a breakthrough. Every obstacle, a leap forward. For every cynic, these inspiring grounds have given us an optimist. And we're back. Is part of the oil curse the fact that countries make a lot of money, but they don't have to tell anybody how much they actually have? That's right. The oil industry is, by some measures, the world's largest industry, okay? Almost 15% of all international trades made up of petroleum. The largest companies in the world, many of them are oil, produce, are oil com companies. But it's also one of the most opaque. It's one of the ones that does the best job of concealing where the money goes and where it comes from and how much is exchanging hands. And this is a key part of the oil curse because people in these oil-rich countries don't really know 
how much money their governments are collecting. And if they don't really know how much is going in, they can't really monitor whether they're getting their fair share. It's this lack of transparency, I think, that opens the door to so much corruption, so much waste, and so much unaccountability. Are there countries that have been able to improve their transparency with regards to oil revenues? There are some, and there's a, an international initiative called the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative that's uh, based, in, uh, based in Norway that tries to promote transparency in, in the oil and, and uh, other mineral sectors. And so there have been some steps forward. Um, there, are, there are some countries that are more democratic, like, let's say, East Timor, um, that have done a great job in making oil revenues more transparent, uh, having audits and releasing those public audits, um, letting their people know what's out there. And that's, I think that's a, an important step towards reversing the oil curse. But they're unfortunately the exception. The rule is that the more oil governments have, the less transparent they tend to be, the less they disclose about their budgets. So if somebody here in Los Angeles wanted to set up a gas station that was just doing fair trade oil, like a fair trade coffee thing, they really wouldn't be able to figure out where oil was sourced, or they couldn't point out to say, you know, this oil came from a democratic, you know, women-friendly state, and this oil came from an autocratic state. Is that right? I mean, why can't we figure out where the oil is coming from that we use in our, ga in our cars every day? That's right. So when you go into, you know, Target or Sears or any store in this country, Every little thing you buy, every trinket, every appliance, every piece of clothing carries a tag that says where it was made, a country of origin label. Okay? By law, everything sold in this country has to have a label saying where it's from. Okay? It empowers us as consumers. For some reason, oil gets around that. There's a loophole that allows oil companies to disclose nothing about where this stuff comes from. Now, if you're an Angelino like me, you spend a lot of money each month, maybe two or three hundred dollars a month typically, uh, on, on gas. So one of the things that I spend the most money on purchasing each month um, is the one thing that I know almost nothing uh, about its origins, about where it comes from. And oil companies like to keep it this way because if you did know, you might not be so anxious to go to the corner gas station and fill up your tank. What's Southern California's history in the oil industry? I mean, obviously there are some big oil companies here. Has it been primarily as, I guess, discovery and exploration in other countries, or has there been oil in Southern California? You know, oil was the leading industry in Southern California uh, for a period of time about 100 years ago. In the 1920s, we were the Persian Gulf of the world. Um, I think in 1923, one out of every four barrels pumped in the world came out of Los Angeles, Los Angeles area. So this was a, uh, a very big oil producing area. And we've kind of forgotten that history. You know, we remember the glorious history of the film industry and um, other parts of Los Angeles history. But we forget that one reason why our, our economy is built on cars, why everybody drives, is that, uh, is that once upon a time gasoline was extremely cheap here because we had so much oil. And it's also why we have, uh, why we're home to some, some large oil companies like Occidental and Getty and uh, Chevron. Um, and, uh, uh, and it's, I think, kind of a shame that we forget that oil played a big part in our own history. Um, and I think there's a lot, of, uh, a lot to be learned by paying more close attention to where the oil comes from and what happens when you, when you spend money on it. I'm thinking in the movie There Will Be Blood. Uh, that was primarily set in the California oil industry and the, from boom, the Upton Sinclair story boom, which is primarily the California oil boom from the 19 teens and 20s. Uh, there's also a moratorium on offshore drilling in California after, really after the 1969 uh, oil right, spill yeah. out in Santa Barbara. Yeah. We're coming up 2012 presidential election. Energy independence and energy production is probably going to be a really big part of this discussion. Uh, can you explain how energy production actually affects domestic oil prices, even if the United States was able to produce all the oil we needed, would that mean that the oil price at the, at the pump would drop? You know, not necessarily. Um, there might be some benefits to being more energy independent. Uh, 
either by us using less or maybe producing more. But lower gas prices can't really predict that. And indeed, the best projections looking ahead for the next few decades are that oil prices are going to stay relatively high. Now, I should add that um, the smartest forecasters, even they have a terrible record of predicting oil prices. Nobody really knows. Um, just when they say they're going to go in one direction, they go in the other direction. So um, I'm, I'm sure my own predictions are no better. But it is important to remember that even if we drill more and pump more and produce more, that won't necessarily have any effect on our prices. Those prices are set at a global level. I was going to say, in a weird way, though, aren't our higher gas prices actually a counterindicator of the oil curse? Because you talk about some of the countries in the oil curse that spend a lot of their money that they bring in keeping their domestic gasoline prices mm -hmm. very low. Mm -hmm. What's the relationship between, I guess, oil price? Is it an inverse relationship between the price of gas that you can get at a pump and, I guess, the level of political representation you have within your country? Well, I think there's something to that, which is that, um, that oil-producing countries, especially authoritarian ones, like to keep gas prices low. And, you know, there's an interesting dynamic there, an interesting uh, story going on. You would think that in democracies where the government's supposed to be more accountable to the people, that there'd be more pressure to keep prices low. And undemocratic regimes, they can get away with whatever they want, so maybe they'll set oil prices at a market level. In fact, it's just the opposite. It's the authoritarian states that are more determined to keep gasoline prices low and electricity pl prices low, to keep people believing that they are truly benefiting from their country's natural resource wealth. Unfortunately, it only just tends to mess up their economies. Um, it tends to cause them to overconsume and be, you know, more quickly uh, adding to uh, global carbon emissions. Um, and maybe it keeps people off the street and keeps people quiet for a while, um, but it's hardly the way for these countries to grow and prosper. We'll be back with a few final thoughts after this. The world needs more impossible, more unconventional, unreasonable, unhinged. Keep telling us we're naive that we should get real, that we don't have a shot. For every barrier, we have a breakthrough. Every obstacle, a leap forward. For every cynic, these inspiring grounds have given us an optimist. And we're back. What did you want to accomplish by riding the oil curse? You know, we're living at a moment when the production of oil is spreading to more and more low-income countries, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, but also in South America and Southeast Asia. The global demand is rising. Production is kind of topped out in the traditional oil-producing countries. And so many new, many new poor countries, Namibia, Tanzania, Ghana, uh, Uganda are starting to produce. So they're at a moment when they're first faced with a windfall of oil revenues. And what I hope is that people will l use my book and other kinds of resources to start thinking about how to use that, that money better to help the people and the country in a sustainable and meaningful way, not simply to help the government stay in power. What's been the reaction to the book so far? So far, pretty good. I think uh, a, a lot of people are interested in the topic. Um, there's a surprising level of interest in this in Africa. You find that when oil is discovered in a, in a new country in, say, Ghana or Tanzania, Mozambique, one of the first questions they're asking now is, how do we avoid this, this resource curse, this oil curse? How do we not become like Nigeria? So I think they're starting to ask the right questions, and I hope I can help provide some answers. Michael Ross, professor of political science at UCLA and author of The Oil Curse, thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Chris. And thanks for watching.